Let's turn in our creeds book to Lord's Day 21. That's on page 104. Lord's Day 21. What believest thou concerning the Holy Catholic Church of Christ? That the Son of God, from the beginning to the end of the world, gathers, defends, and preserves to himself, by his Spirit and Word, out of the whole human race, a church chosen to everlasting life, agreeing in true faith. And that I am, and forever shall remain, a living member thereof. What do you understand by the communion of saints? First, that all and everyone who believes, being members of Christ, are, in common, partakers of him and of all his riches and gifts. Secondly, that everyone must know it to be his duty, readily and cheerfully to employ his gifts, for the advantage and salvation of other members. What believest thou concerning the forgiveness of sins? That God, for the sake of Christ's satisfaction, will no more remember my sins, neither my corrupt nature, against which I have to struggle all my life long, but will graciously impute to me the righteousness of Christ, that I may never be condemned before the tribunal of God. The communion of saints, beloved, is very obviously an appealing <coughs> subject because it deals with closeness and fellowship. And enjoying the communion of saints that's the title of tonight's sermon, is even more attractive. Who in their right mind does not want enjoyment and gladness? So we're looking at enjoying the communion of the saints. And so I take it for granted this evening that you are all keen on learning about enjoying the communion of saints, you individually, you and your family, and you and your church, enjoying the communion of saints. Now in explaining the truth of this article of our creed, I'm going especially to point out ways in which you can go wrong and lose the joy of the communion of the saints, as well as positively explaining the way to enjoy the communion of the saints, which we all want to do. And it will be evident to you by now that tonight's sermon on Lord's Day 21 will not focus on the one holy Catholic Church of Christ, question and answer 54, or the forgiveness of sins, question and answer 56, but tonight we're going to treat question and answer 55 on the communion of the saints, though with some reference to the other two articles of the Apostles' Creed explained here, particularly towards the end of the sermon. Let's consider then, enjoying the communion of the saints, the parties who enjoy the communion of the saints, the calling to enjoy the communion of the saints, and the manner of enjoying the communion of the saints. Enjoying that communion of the saints, the parties, the calling, and the manner. The first way to go wrong regarding the communion of the saints and one's enjoyment of it is to think that the communion of the saints primarily concerns our fellowship with other believers. That's a mistake. This is how some people especially go wrong at this point. 
well, I'm not enjoying fellowship with the other saints the way I'd like to, or the way I used to, or the way I should do. So therefore, the communion of the saints isn't working for me, and this article, really, I can't be bothered with it. It just doesn't work. Well, that's too low, and it's too low because it's too earthly a view of the communion of the saints. The communion of the saints is first and foremost the fellowship that believers have with Jesus Christ himself. And if you get that wrong, you're going to be orientated the wrong way to this truth and it will affect your spiritual life. This is how answer 55 begins when it explains what the communion of the saints is and that's why I said this is the first way to go wrong because this is the first truth stated by our confession, first, this is what the communion of the saints is, first, that all and everyone who believes, being members of Christ, are in common partakers of him and of all his riches and gifts. That's what the communion of the saints is first. The catechism has it right. If you leave out the first half of question and answer 55, then the church is debased into a mere social club. Then the church becomes simply a place where we go to enjoy each other's company. Now, you ought to enjoy each other's company, and that is part of what the church is and part of what the communion of the saints is. But if that's the only thing that it is, then the church is debased. It's just a social club. The world is filled with social clubs. It's coming down with social clubs. And this is exactly the case with the false and liberal churches. They're just social clubs. That's it. God is mentioned every now and again, but it's primarily not vertical with God, but just horizontal. Because humanism takes over. And it's as if Jesus Christ is not sitting at the right hand of God as the Saviour and Lord of the church. The child of God enjoys the communion of the saints with Christ himself principally. And the believer enjoys this communion with Christ as he or she listens to the Lord by reading and meditating upon the scriptures. That's communion. God in Christ speaking to us. And we in turn speaking, seeking the face of the Lord in prayer. The believer communes with Christ, the communion of the saints, because Christ is a holy Christ and we are holy. The believer enjoys the communion of the saints when he avails himself of Christ's priesthood and sacrifice as he continually confesses his sins and trusts in the cross of Jesus. That's the communion of the saints. He's drawing upon Jesus Christ for blessings and blessedness from the Savior's wells of salvation. As they're described in Isaiah 12, which wells of salvation in Isaiah 12 are the wells dug by Jesus Christ as the King and Saviour of Jews and Gentiles in Isaiah 11. Each believer experiences the communion of the saints with Christ and hence with the triune God as he or she keeps up a lively and active faith. Because faith is the way in which we commune with Christ and receive his benefits. As the believer maintains a good and clear conscience. You can't maintain communion with Christ with a guilty conscience. But as soon as you seek rest in that guilty conscience and confessing your sins, then the channel of communion with him is reopened. And as the believer also abounds in gratitude. The communion of the saints is first of all that Everyone who believes as a member of Christ partakes of him and of all his riches 
and gifts. And so the believer experiencing the communion of the saints is a thankful person. The communion of the saints means gratitude. Because we're communing with someone who's rich. And it's all one way. It's a one way street. We add nothing. We share in. We receive. We are given. We are graced with. His riches. And his gifts. Because we're all just beggars. And that's true. This is I say the teaching of our reformed faith. What do you understand by the communion of the saints? To sum it all up this point. What did you learn in church tonight? The first thing I learned was that the communion of saints means that everyone who believes is a member of Christ and partakes of him and all his riches and gifts. And then, and only then, and with that straight, we can talk about how we commune with one another. But you have to get that straight. There's another way to go wrong. Regarding the communion of the saints at this point. It is to reckon that it only involves communing with the living God in Jesus Christ. And this is how some people err at this point. Well I do search the scriptures diligently. In fact I dare say I'm a whole lot more earnest in reading the scriptures than a lot of members In churches. Well I have a far better library of theological books in my house. And I've read a number of them. So such an objector goes. And I dare say I have a lot more and better books. Than some of the people in that church down the road. And I listen to a lot of sermons online. And I dare say the two they get on Sunday is enough for them. So I'm all right. But I don't need, and this is where the problem goes in, because all of those things, apart from the stinking attitude, but all of those activities in themselves are good, but I don't need a good Reformed Church. I can get by fine without a church that clearly manifests the three marks of a true church with faithful preaching, faithful sacramental administration, and faithful church discipline. And now, on top of all that, you can just try and prove to me that I need to be a member of a true congregation of Christ anyway. And here we need to stress the second part of answer 55, and to say that both parts are necessary. Part one is, in explaining the communion of the saints, that everyone who believes as a member of Christ partakes of him and all his riches and gifts, And now, secondly, that everyone must know it to be his duty readily and cheerfully to employ his gifts for the advantage and salvation of other members. And that, for that to be done properly, involves lively church membership. And that's the case very obviously because our Heidelberg Catechism is bound with our Belgic Confession as part of the three forms of unity. Belgic Confession, Article 28, is titled Everyone is bound to join himself to the true church. Everyone, bar none, is bound to join himself to the true church where at all possible. And I'm going to read it to you. We believe since this Holy congregation is an assembly of those who are saved and out of it there is no salvation that no person of whatsoever state or condition he may be ought to withdraw himself to live in a separate state from it. But that all men are in duty bound to join and unite themselves with it maintaining the unity of the church submitting themselves to the doctrine and discipline thereof bowing their necks under the yoke of Jesus Christ and as mutual members of the same body, serving to the edification of the brethren according to the talents God has given them. And that this may be the more effectually observed, it is the duty of all believers, according to the word of God, to separate themselves from all those who do not belong to the church, And to join themselves to this congregation 
wheresoever God hath established it, even though the magistrates and edicts of princes be against it, yea, though they should suffer death or any other corporal punishment. Therefore, all those who separate themselves from the same or do not join themselves to it act contrary to the ordinance of God. And that's not just our Belgic Confession. That's the teaching of the Westminster Confession of Calvin's Catechism of the Church of Geneva, of the Second Helvetic Confession written by Heinrich Bullinger, of the Bohemian Confession of the Czech Republic, of Luther's larger catechism and therefore of worldwide Lutheranism as well as worldwide Reformed and Presbyterian churches. But there's a third way. A third way to err regarding with whom or the parties we are to fellowship in the communion of the saints. Someone could say, well, I do fellowship with Jesus Christ. And I am a member of the church. So I have both bases covered, the first half and the second half of answer 55. So I am okay. But I only commune with some people in the church. Technically, and on paper, and on the rules, I'm there, I'm a member, but my fellowship is just with my family. Or I commune with those in the church who are, how would you put it, sort of my type of people in the congregation. Not everybody's my type of person. Or I fellowship with the people whom I think like me. Or I fellowship with the people in the church whom I like. And as for the rest of them, well, they can just go their own merry little way. Now, I'm not saying, of course, that you are going to be equally close to everybody in the church. It's impossible to be equally close to everybody in the church. No one has ever managed it. And it's not actually your calling. It is, in fact, natural and proper that you are going to be closer to some members of the church than others because of particular common interests or because of your age and the age of this other person or because of your gender or because of your family situation. Well, they have small children like me and so I naturally talk with them and we can share a lot and all that's, that's very good. Because of our past connections between me and this person because of, well, I sit at the front and that person's at the back and I hardly ever see them. All those things are natural, proper, and there's nothing wrong with them at all. But we're dealing here with sinful exclusion, whereby I avoid people, or worse yet, I snub people. Or my attitude is, though I never actually say it, I don't want anything to do with her. And when I can see to it that I can arrange things, I actually don't have anything to do with her because I don't want anything to do with her. And this person, this guy, he isn't welcome in our group. And what are you saying with such things? It is the equivalent, and this is how Paul argues in Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians 12, it's the equivalent of this. Is it right for the hand to say of the left kneecap, I don't, don't need you. I'm going to have nothing in common with you. I'm going to avoid you wherever possible. Or of the nose to say about the big toe, I don't like you. I'm going to bypass you if I possibly can't do it. Listen again to the middle part of Lord's Day 21. What do you understand by the communion of the saints? What does that phrase mean? First, that all and everyone who believes, being members of Christ, are in common partakers of him and of all his riches and gifts. Secondly, that everyone must know it to be his duty readily and cheerfully to employ his gifts for the advantage and salvation 
of other members. And so the communion of the saints for us here involves, first of all, my congregation. Without anybody being cold-shouldered or set apart or isolated. It involves, next most obviously, our missionary fellowship in Limerick, when you have a chance to meet with them. But they're four hours drive away and that isn't always possible. It involves, obviously too, and I'm speaking constitutionally here, of our sister churches in America and Canada and Singapore, which includes also, therefore, their mission work in the Philippines. And it also includes... Other Christians, outside of all of those parties, as far as both love on the one hand and the truth on the other, and as far as your time and your other commitments allow, the communion of the saints. Fellow members of Jesus Christ sharing in the same anointing. That's the parties. Now, with regard to the calling of the communion of the saints as respects fellowship with one another, there are various ways of going wrong here, and so missing the joy and catching the grief. First of all, some may think that the communion of saints is all about what other people will do for me. Now, in the communion of the saints, other people will end up doing things for you, most definitely. But the communion of the saints is not about, at least not primarily about, and it isn't the issue of calling what other people do for me. You would go wrong if you were to think, the communion of the saints, oh, that's wonderful. What that means is, I want him or her to visit me, To approach me to talk, because I never want to have to do anything and put myself out. To phone me, to help me, to listen to me, and they've all got to do this for me. With nary a thought that I also have a calling to visit the other person, or to approach him or her, or to phone him or her, or to help him or her, or to listen to him and her. So the communion of the saints then becomes a one-way street To help me. With that attitude, you won't enjoy the communion of the saints. And you will be very discontent. Your attitude must not be, well the minister said that everybody else has to do this. And therefore I can default my bit and everybody will just suit me down to the ground. So that I want everything done by this person and that person. And in fact everybody else when it suits me, and how it suits me, but just don't ask me to do anything or to put myself out for anybody else. Because the communion of the saints, as I understand, and the way I want it is, they've got to do this for me. But that isn't seeking the communion of the saints. That's seeking yourself. That's not fellowship. That's selfishness. And what does the proverb say? He that would have friends must show himself friendly. And our catechism again has it dead right. It does not say that the communion of the saints is waiting for everybody else to do everything you want. What the catechism says about the communion of the saints is it speaks of our calling Towards one another. Secondly. Answer 55 continues. That everyone must know it to be his duty. Readily and cheerfully to employ his gifts. For the advantage and salvation of other members. It's not. Ask what your church can do for you. To paraphrase a well known phrase. But ask what I can do for the other members of the body. That's the approach, that's the mentality, that's the thinking, and that attitude is crucial 
to enjoying the communion of the saints. Romans 12 maintains the same perspective. It does not say anywhere that the child of God must stand upon his own rights and compel everybody else to do what he or she wants. It tells us, after the imagery of the body in verses 4 and 5, for instance, it tells us our calling, what we must do. Verse 6, Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, that is prophesy according to the proportion of faith, or ministry, that is service, well then let us wait upon our service. Or he that teaches on teaching, or he that exhorteth on exhortation, he that giveth, it all deals with what I have to do, he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. And simplicity is the opposite of duplicity, that is doing something with two motives, sort of one right motive and one wrong motive. Simplicity means doing it with one motive, the pure motive of the service of God. He that showeth mercy, another calling, let him do it with cheerfulness. And this is the mindset of one who enjoys the communion of the saints. Others first, not me. Verse 10 says that we must be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love in honor preferring one another. Or to render it differently at the end of verse 10, giving preference to one another, not to oneself and one's own interests. At this point, someone might say, okay, I see your point. All right. I am to help others, but I'll do it if it suits me. And you you know how we're going. You already see the problem there. I'll do it if it suits me. To summarize that position using theological terms, don't worry, theological terms you'll all understand. Such a person believes in a conditional calling in the communion of the saints because condition is all about if a conditional calling in the communion of the saints with regard to one's fellow believer I will do this if I feel like it I will help you if I'm in the right mood and that is a practical form of another conditional covenant and we're against conditional covenants It's a sort of conditional covenant communion with our brothers and sisters in the church. Imagine if marriage was a conditional covenant. That's why, of course, some people end up divorcing each other and hitting one another. Well, I'll love you as a wife if you submit to me. Or she may say, well, I'll submit to you if you love me. But marriage isn't a conditional contract. And people who view it that way are going to make a mess of their relationship. The Christian attitude is, even though my husband or wife has treated me badly, my calling hasn't changed. What about a conditional covenant of fellowship with our children? So if our children don't give us the respect that we think they should, well then we'll just not make their bed, we'll just not feed them, we'll not help them get dressed for school in the morning. Now there's ways of chastising your children, but that's not chastising your children. That's a conditional relationship to your children. God does not say in any of the Ten Commandments, you must keep this commandment, the first, the second, the third, the fourth, the fifth, all the way way to the tenth, if you're being treated okay. They're unconditional commandments and all such ways of thinking a conditional covenant fellowship in the church or a conditional covenant of marriage or a conditional covenant fellowship with our children really flows from a wrong idea of the covenant of grace as if God's covenant of grace was conditional and we do our bit if things are going our way we don't believe in conditional covenants we don't believe in conditional covenant communions either Our calling towards one another in the communion of the saints is not 
an option when we're feeling like it, but it's a duty. And for proof, I quote answer 55 again. Secondly, that everyone must know, and be absolutely sure of it, everyone must know it to be his duty, not an option or a thing you can do if you're in the right mood. It's his duty. And this is exactly the approach of Romans chapter 12. Verse 9, let love be without dissimulation. It doesn't say love your fellow saint if he loves you back or if he loves you as much as you would like to be loved. Your love must be without hypocrisy, period. Abhor that which is evil. Not abhor that which is evil unless the evil actually works in some strange way for your advantage. Cleave to that which is good. Always cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affectioned one to another in brotherly love, not if this person has been rubbing you up the right way. In honour, preferring one another doesn't mean, well, you prefer your people who are the friends in the church and the people you don't rate, well, you can look down your nose at them. Not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. But speaking about this calling as a duty, an unconditional duty, it would now be a misunderstanding if someone thought that we create the communion of the saints with our brethren by our activities and by our attitude. We don't create the communion of the saints. It's all of grace. Our communion of the saints with Jesus Christ, that's of grace. He creates it. We were elected in the Lord Jesus before he uttered the words, let there be light. We were redeemed in his blood 2,000 years ago before ever you and I were thought of. And we received the gift of the Holy Spirit in regeneration and we were completely <coughs> passive like the little girl baptized this morning. And our communion of the saints with each other is included in our communion of the saints with Jesus Christ. Very simple. If I am united to Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit, so I have communion with him, and if you are united to Christ and have communion with him by the Holy Spirit, think of two lines going up from us straight to heaven, well then I am related to you through Jesus Christ. So we have communion in the same Spirit of Christ that binds both of us to the Lord Jesus. And our communion is therefore a fact. We don't create it, we believe it. And by believing it and living according to that faith, we enjoy the communion of saints. But we don't create it. And then, understanding this gospel fact by faith, that is, believing our communion with Christ, we are called to serve each other's salvation. There's a fact to believe. Notice the indicative here. Answer 55. Everyone who believes is in common partakers of him and of all his riches and gifts. That's a simple fact. And out of that flows the calling to obey. So everyone must know it to be his duty. Since that's the case. Readily and cheerfully to employ his gifts for the advantage and salvation of other members. We've looked at the parties in the communion of the saints. We've looked at the calling of the communion of the saints. Now we need to look finally at the manner. What is the manner of fulfilling our calling in the communion of the saints now as regards one another in the body. It's summed up in our Heidelberg Catechism in two adverbs. And adverbs are words which qualify or describe a verb. The two adverbs are readily and cheerfully. Readily and cheerfully. 
what some of the parents wouldn't give at times to have their children do exactly what they're told readily. And to do exactly what they're told cheerfully. Oh, that would make parenting so much more of a joy than sadly it often is. We must readily encourage and comfort one another. We must readily instruct the ignorant. We must readily preserve the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace so that we don't have to be kicked, dragged, kicking and screaming to do our duty. As sometimes you end up having to do literally with your children. You lift them by the shoulders and say, now you are going to do this. And they're shouting and their feet are going back and forwards. That's not the way God calls us or our children to obey him. We must cheerfully give assistance to the needy. Not as if it pained us or hurt us. We must cheerfully share with the poor. This is the right attitude. Romans 12. Distributing to the necessity of the saints. Given to hospitality. Verse 13. Verse 16 adds. Be of the same mind one towards another. A ready mind. A cheerful mind. Minding not high things. But condescending to men of low estate. And being not wise in our own conceits. And how then are we going to do this? Readily, cheerfully, obeying our calling in the communion of the saints with other believers who are far from perfect. Well, the only way we can do this, as you will readily understand, is by the gracious spirit of one who knows and continually experiences the forgiveness of sins. If you're not living in the consciousness of the forgiveness of sins, the ready, cheerful spirit to seek the communion of the saints won't be there. This is the connection, theologically, between the last two question and answers of Lord's Day 21. Question and answer 55, the communion of the saints. Question and answer 56, the forgiveness of sins. What do you believe about the forgiveness of sins? God doesn't remember my sins. God doesn't impute to me that evil, the guilt of my evil nature against which I struggle. But God graciously reckons to my account the righteousness of Christ so that I'm never going to be condemned before God's great judgment seat in the last day. That's what I believe. And the one who knows God's rich grace in Jesus Christ in the forgiveness of sins, not just, well, I was saved 35 years ago and my sins are forgiven, but I don't need any of that now, but rather, all the time, the continual forgiveness of sins just as we continually sin, well, that person is going to understand, practice, and enjoy the communion of of the saints. Freely you have received. Freely give. This person has freely received the forgiveness of sins. Continually. And so he will freely give. Including giving himself to other saints. God gives me. Says the believer. All the blessings of salvation. Readily. And cheerfully. So I will employ my gifts that he has given me for the salvation of the other members readily and cheerfully. That's the connection. So the brother or sister who is continually partaking of the riches of Jesus Christ and his salvation and the love of God, that brother and that sister will deal in love with his fellow saints. And love with one's fellow saints. Given that they are sinful and weak. And do stupid things. Sometimes do stupid things that are so stupid. You shake your head and you think. How in all the world did they go and do that? What does love mean? Two words. Long suffering. You suffer. And you suffer long. Forbearing. You put up with a lot. A 
Such a person who knows the love of God and forgiving him his sins will believe and practice the truth in the church that charity covers the multitude of sins. Somebody's done something on me. Is it serious enough that it's going to bother me? Then I need to go the way of Matthew 18 and talk about it. And if it isn't that serious, I'm going to forget about it. You have had to forget so many things that your children have done on you. You've had to forget so many things that your wife or your husband has done on you. Or what your neighbor has done on you. You you couldn't get by in life without letting things go. Well, you have to do that in the church. Now, if it's serious, then you don't sweep sin under the carpet. Now, it needs to be dealt with. But if it's some lesser thing, charity covers the multitude of sins. Not just one or two things. A multitude. And you go on with life. 1 Corinthians 13 verse 5 teaches the great chapter on charity and love. What does it say? Charity keeps no account of evil. It doesn't have a big long list. You would probably be divorced by now if your wife or your husband kept a list of all your sins. You might well have kicked your children out in the street if you'd kept a list of all their sins. But you love them. You deal with the big sins. And you say, God have mercy upon them and the rest. And you move on. A believer who knows the love of God to him. In sending Christ to the cross. And forgiving all the many iniquities against God. Far more innumerable than sins that the brother has done against you or me. He doesn't hate his brother or sister in the church. You say I wouldn't be hating anybody in the church. That would be a terrible thing to do. But the Bible says that if charity covers the multitude of sins, hatred doesn't cover the multitude of sins. Hatred keeps a record of the sins against him or her. Hatred piles them up and meditates upon them and aggravates them and says, look what this person's done to me. It's not an awful person. What a horrible person. Ah, The problem with that is it's a boomerang. God says if you, unless it's a really big sin, And if it's a big sin and serious and it's really destructive of their spiritual life, then you've got to talk to them, Matthew 18. But you're the one that's guilty of the hating. Because you're keeping a record of all these sins. And charity doesn't do that. Charity keeps no account of evil. The one who knows that God is not going to be angry with us to destroy us because of our iniquity, remembers and is enabled to obey these admonitions near the end of Romans 12. Verse 17, recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of men. Verse 19, dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. And that means give wrath to the one that's due, because the place to give wrath to is God. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay. We have no place in keeping or demonstrating vengeance. You give that over to God. God, there's sin been done here against me. You must deal with that sin. And verse 21 says, be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. And if we want to connect question and answer 55 with the previous question and answer, we can say that the communion of the saints adds beauty and luster to the doctrines of Lord's Day 21. How many attributes or perfections are there in the church? What are they? Well, question and answer 54 explains the church Her glory consists in the fact that she's one and that she's holy and that she's Catholic or universal, male and female, every tongue, language, type of people, vocation and all the rest and that she's apostolic. That is, she follows apostolic doctrine of the New Testament which summarizes and explains the Old Testament too. One holy, Catholic and apostolic church. And if you say that and you're dealing and you're in the midst of a congregation where the communion of the saints isn't being practiced and enjoyed, 
Some unbeliever who comes in and says, you know, the minister preached this lovely. He painted this church. Oh, it was beautiful. One holy, Catholic and apostolic. But they're tearing the faces off each other. They're devouring one another. But if you preach that in connection with the communion of the saints being properly displayed, that shows the vitality, the vibrancy, the attractiveness of the church in her four perfections. And then the church honors God and is a good witness that God may use to draw others to herself. Let's think of some of the other glorious doctrines mentioned in this Lord's Day. Election is here. Answer 54 talks about a church chosen or elected to everlasting life. Think of the communion of the saints in connection with that. All who believe were chosen in Jesus Christ before the foundation of the world. We've got lots in common. We've got lots in common even before we were born. Because we were all chosen in Christ before God made the universe. That same answer, 54, teaches the perseverance of the saints, of every saint. Because it says, regarding this church, and this is the confession of every true believer, possessing assurance of salvation, as he or she ought to have, I am... And forever shall remain a living member of the church. That is, I believe that God will preserve me to the very end. And therefore I will persevere through all trials. And the saints enjoy communion with one another too. Because they all seek the entirety of their salvation day by day in Jesus Christ. That's in common One more. Answer 56 includes the truth of justification. That is that God will graciously impute to me or reckon to my account the righteousness of Christ. We all have that together. That's what binds us. Not what sporting team we support or how intellectual we are or are not. Justification. Enjoying the communion of the saints. That's our subject tonight. You should do that. And you should enjoy it with all the others in Christ's church and honor our common head. Amen. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, draw us closer to thee that we may commune with thee each day seven days a week, and so come together as those already communing with Christ, and so with one another, that thou, Lord, may deepen our fellowship, not only with thee, but also with brothers and sisters in the church, and that we may learn more about the breadth and height and depth and length of the love of Jesus Christ our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen.